Anyone else? Yes. Sir, what if a writer is attempting to create a story where nothing much happens, where people don't change, they don't have any epiphanies, they struggle and are frustrated and nothing is resolved? More reflection of the real world. The real world? Yes, sir. The real fucking world. First of all, you write a screenplay without conflict or crisis, you'll bore your audience to tears. Secondly, nothing happens in the world? Are you out of your fucking mind? People are murdered every day. There's genocide, war, corruption. Every fucking day, somewhere in the world, somebody sacrifices his life to save somebody else. Every fucking day, someone somewhere takes a conscious decision to destroy someone else. People find love. People lose it. For Christ's sake, a child watches a mother beaten to death on the steps of a church. Someone goes hungry. Somebody else betrays his best friend for a woman. If you can't find that stuff in life, then you, my friend, don't know crap about life. And why the fuck are you wasting my two precious hours with your movie? I don't have any use for it. I don't have any bloody use for it. Happy heresies and welcome to the desert of the real, my beloved true seekers. Welcome with kindness and love to Aeon Bite, the only weekly radio show on Gnosticism, the Gnostics, and Gnosis, as well as their brethren in the esoterica. No, I'll be damned in Gary, Indiana before I call it a podcast. 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 Aeon Bite is broadcast from the virtual Alexandria, that state of mind where East meets West, through the God above God that can. We don't take prisoners, we liberate them. We are the revival of the Gnostic heresy in the name of Hypatia of Alexandria. We will not serve in heaven, rule in hell, or take Mai Tai orders on earth. We want more, so much more beyond all that was and never was and should have been. And we always shy away from scholarly pontification and definitely shy away from New Age babble. This is your life. Don't play hard to get. This is a dream of you. I mustn't run away. 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 I am and I am Abraxas, that terrible god above God as the ancients knew him, in his mortal incarnation of Miguel Connor in some basement studio in the concrete tundra of Chicago. I am your psychopomp into the dream worlds of your actualized daemon of Socrates, or the divine twin of the Acts of John, your benign Charon over the Styx rivers of ignorance and forgetfulness paddling away to the farthest shores of imagination. I am, I am you. Or like Aeon Bite's patron saint, Simon Magus wrote, Thou and I are but one. Soulmate. It's extremely rare, but it exists. Sort of like twin souls tuned into each other. And even better, instead of my usual, We are the Gnostics, squirrel puke, let me quote from Simon's great enunciation or great revelation as has survived in the writings of the church father Hippolytus. There is in everyone the divine power existing in a latent condition. This is one power divided above and below, generating itself, making itself grow, seeking itself, finding itself, daughter of itself son of itself, mother, father, unity, being a source of the entire circle of existence. And that's what we're about, we iconoclasts, idolaters, blasphemers, luciferian artists, and Loki freethinkers. We seek the red stars of truth, rape the boundaries of reality, and romance the possibilities of thought and mystic flight, as well as suffer from the heartbreak of sensing too much 
and the bittersweet tenderness of loving with so much passion. We seek to know the unknown and the deconstruction of self-knowledge, that great apothegm written in the oracle of Delphi by the serpent priestesses of Apollo, the Pythonesses, as they were called, and the incarnations of Sophia in the golden age that never was, but can be found within our scarred hearts. From the dawn of time we came, moving silently down through the centuries, living many secret lives. And on this approximately Saturday, February 6, the year of our Demiurge 2010, we seek self-knowledge, Nothisathon in Greek, through one of the great mirrors of our epoch. Truly a glass darkly, but one that we can project upon so accurately, my beloved true seekers. And that is the medium of cinema and the Gnostic admonition contained in its light-filled innards. What the hell is this? After all, unlike orthodoxy that shot itself in the cloven foot by confining their scripture solely on paper, Gnosticism is a fluid holy virus taking many forms including music, television, anime, poetry, and Jennifer Beale's rear end. And of course movies. We've dealt with both blatant and subtle Gnostic cinema on Aeon Bite before and often. The following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. We even gorge on this topic on Aeon Bite number 12 and Aeon Bite number 50, respectively, which you should download as companions because on this venture we take a slightly different but just as potent angle on the Gnostic Gospels in the form of celluloid. And perhaps much starker and with more urgency because you might not like what the mirror reveals what your reflection truly is. All I've ever known to be true is a lie. For this third installment, our astral guest is Jason Horsley, author of Matrix Warrior, Blood Poets, and the new The Secret Life of Movies, Schizophrenic and Shamanic Journeys in American Cinema, which we will be fornicating on this eternal now. Jason is also a filmmaker, fiction author, and an insightful social philosopher without compromises or apologies, but with a gossamer sensitivity that is rare even with artists. And the secret life of movies, beyond a complete exposition on the impact of films that captures the zeitgeist of American culture, is indeed an Orpheus descent into the heart of darkness of mankind. But the book also reveals the possibility of the redemption of mankind in an information era of melting boundaries and coagulating identity confusion. What am I doing here? Why did I bother to come here today? Nobody even seems to know my name. I've been on this planet for 40 years and I'm no closer to understanding a single thing. Why am I here? How did I get here? The byline of the book says it all, my beloved true seekers. After all, and arguably, film blurs the lines of myth and reality better than any other medium. And myth is the language of our spirit and the state of the union of our collective unconscious attempting to guide us to our aboriginal source, individuation, the pleroma, the divine imagination, Jennifer Beale's rear end, Call it what you will. Are you running a high fever? How could you conceive of something so idiotic? No other medium asks us more to paradoxically divorce our personas while we commune in silent longing with those around us, but also engage our deeper selves beyond our lubricated emotions and thoughts while we are bathed in a gentle storm of digital light and story that disintegrates our very being. If I'm not me, who the hell am I? Going to the movies, unless it really sucks leprechaun phalluses, is indeed a shamanistic journey, 
a sort of mystery school initiation of arcane days, when the higher fans went into tunnels of sound and eerie illumination, stoned out of their Greco-Roman minds on Ergot, and were forced to witness the eternal drama of the dying rising god-man, or the savior goddess descending into the underworld. You, no trouble. Me, fifth element. Supreme being. And what Jason reveals in his formidable book is that, if art imitates life or vice versa, then modern civilization has indeed become schizophrenic in a very Spartan sense. And by schizophrenia, Jason doesn't mean, as he writes, that wastebasket term doctors use for any psychosis that comes their way. No, he means it in a more esoteric context. And the medium itself, if you hadn't caught already with my previous claptrap, already denotes a schizophrenia by the way we interact with it. Just think of the next time you're at the movies. Think of what you're actually going through. What you are. Where is your consciousness? Where is your body? Who do your thoughts and emotions really belong to? It's like a mystery school. An initiation. A deconstruction and reconstruction of what you are or hope to be. I think he's right. There's something about this that, that, that's so black. It's like, how much more black could this be? And the answer is, none. And beyond the experience, modern American film has shown us that our oh-so-enlightened society has become increasingly fragmented, out of touch with deeper, meaningful realities, and struggling to find some sort of psychic comfort. Beyond the apparent rise of Gnostic thing movies, the great cultural films, actors and directors of our era reflect back to us our desperate struggle to survive in a postmodern world, a paranoia of modern achievements and institutions, and a fear of an empty universe ruled by dark powers. <laughs> and while you're jumping from one foot to the next, what is he doing? He's laughing his sick fucking ass off. He's a tight ass. He's a sadist. He's an absentee landlord. Yet the mirror also hints at the possibility of an alchemical reformation that begins a journey of man's return to his spiritual womb. Just think for a moment of the history-defining actors and directors in our last generation and what they're telling us. It's no mistake that such icons as Marlon Brando, Robert De Niro, Jack Nicholson, or Johnny Depp, in their lasting roles we love so much, basically play the perennial schizophrenic, the outcasts of society suffering from dementia, an alienated wandering jester of the universes of the acceptable. What makes it so hard is not that you had it bad, but that you're that pissed that so many others had it good. Think of the frenzied, existential and often nihilistic visionary worlds of Hitchcock, Polanski, Lynch, Coppola, Scorsese and Burton, just to name a few, that will never cease to quote, admire and, as in Taxi Driver and others, often relive or reenact. Someday a real rain will come and wash all this scum off the streets. Think of our perverse intercourse with, as Jason would call it, the blood poetry of the Tarantino treatises. The various horror films like The Exorcist, The Shining, or An Inconvenient Truth We Dare Not Forget. Or perhaps science fiction savage ballets like Alien, The Thing, or Pitch Black. Think of so many other films that are a reflection of you without your mask on. For you are the Dark Knight, the Thomas Anderson, the Ellen Ripley, the Beetlejuice, the Chief Brompton. You are them and you have, in the metaphor that is film, become schizophrenic, paranoid, and uncomfortably numb. I may sound like a lunatic, but I'm not crazy. 
You are the one who is literally and figuratively ruled and trained by machinery. Understand that insects and aliens truly rule the cosmos. Accept that there is a conspiracy of toga wearing archons in every corner of society. And you and all of us must find a way out. Like Krishna Muti put it so well, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. When a person is insane, as you clearly are, do you know that you're insane? Maybe you're just sitting around, reading guns and ammo, masturbating in your own feces. Do you just stop and go, wow, it is amazing how fucking crazy I really am. And it was the Gnostics, the first depth psychologists, as Jung called them, who warned of the schizophrenia of humanity in the Greco-Roman times, of a shrinking, quickly changing world where religion and reason battle. A world ruled by endless egos and the cosmic egos in the shape of haughty gods. Sometimes the gods bless you in the morning and curse you in the afternoon. We've come full circle 2,000 years later and the Gnostics continue to warn us of our destabilized essences through their evangelions on the silver screen. Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. And of course, you might say, what about allegedly sober movies like Star Wars, Titanic, The Lord of the Rings, or, yuck, Avatar? Again, this plays right into the hands of myth. After all, what Lucas and Cameron did was simply borrow from the well of mythology and transpose it over the societal issues of our times. George Lucas and his 70s haircut even admitted reading Joseph Campbell before he filmed his one decent episode. You said it, man. You can't lose with that, my beloved true seekers, because, again bringing up you, myths are public dreams, and the public dream has become a nightmare. We are byproducts of a lifestyle obsession. Murder, crime, poverty, these things don't concern me. What concerns me? Celebrity magazines, television with 500 channels, some guy's name on my underwear, Rogaine, Viagra. There is certainly escapism in movies, but let me bring up again schizophrenia. By losing ourselves into the winds of the story, we oddly find ourselves touching briefly on our stronger aspects, what we hope to be as well. Joseph Campbell also wrote that myth, besides being that secret language of the spirit, helps us anchor ourselves to our communities, no matter how airsick they are. You are not your job. You're not how much money you have in the bank. You're not the car you drive. You're not the contents of your wallet. You're not your fucking khakis. Believe me, my beloved true seekers, as soon as you read The Secret Life of Movies, or after the interview, you might never regard going to the Cineplex the same. You'll understand that each, from Snow White to the Watchmen, are metaphors, symbols, and archetypes nudging at you to truly do what the Gnostics and the other mystics have never stopped urging you to do, and that is know thyself. It's not that you're crazy. It's that you've forgotten that you were cast in a lunatic asylum. The chaos of the Valentinians, the desert of the real, just like Sophia, the Shekinah, the Kabbalah, Christ in the flesh, Jehovah himself who locked the door and threw away the key and found himself on the inside looking out. I am the supreme being. I'm not entirely dim. Regardless of your ideology or theology, I certainly advise you to read The Secret Life of Movies. Like our astral guests on Aeon Bide have repeated so many times, before we become whole, we must first realize how splintered we are, individually and collectively. But enough of my drivel. Jason Horsley on The Secret Life of Movies. 
and the secrets we haven't been facing recently, doing a much better presentation than my termite-riddled brain could ever manage. And you'll admit Jason has a great silky voice, kind of like listening to Morgan Freeman. You almost don't care what he's saying. But let us travel to our shamanistic journey here at Aeon Bite. Lose your mind and come to your senses. Don't suffer from insanity, but revel in it. Welcome to the desert of the real, my beloved true seekers. This is the Aeon Bite interview, and with us we have the pleasure of having Jason Horsley to discuss his new book, The Secret Life of Movies, Schizophrenic and Shamanic Journeys in American Cinema. How are you doing today, Jason? I'm pretty good, Miguel. How are you doing? I'm doing very good. Thank you very much for coming on the show. <laughs> when did the schizophrenic theme first creep into American cinema? That's um, something that I only discovered in the process of writing the book, because it only became really obvious, I would say, in the last 30 years or so, maybe in the 70s, was when it really came all the way to the surface with uh, films like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Taxi Driver and what have you. Uh, and then, of course, more recently with films like The Matrix and Dark City and Fight Club, the theme was all the way on the surface. So I guess you could say it was films like this that inspired me to present this thesis, but then once I did begin to work on it, I cast my gaze back in time, and I discovered, at least to my own satisfaction, that the the first signs of this schizophrenic undercurrent, if you will, of American cinema goes back to as far as the, the 30s. And speaking in terms of genres, because obviously one could pick individual movies that were schizophrenic, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, for example, or uh, Fritz Lang's M, or, but my approach isn't so much related to the subject matter as to the subtext. So it might not be in the, in the story or the characters or anything, there might not be an obviously schizophrenic element, but in the, what I call the occult text, you know, the, the hidden thematic content of a film. So for example, in the 30s, so we're really almost talking like the beginning of movies as we know them, because sound only came in 1927. So really, pretty much the start of cinema as it is today, as this, this entertainment medium. Uh, the 30s, we had the screwball comedy with uh, actors like Henry Fonda or James Stewart. And Gary Grant, and and the basic sort of elements of that of the screwball comedy was this very straight-laced guy who's very uptight, very serious, academic, or repressed, sexually repressed, or insecure, what have you, and this this crazy dame who would come into his life and just turn his life upside down. So you've got films like The Lady Eve or Bringing Up Baby, and this is basically it's a sort of pattern, a sort of um, the basic structure of these films, even though they have different stories, that's the basic the, the, the theme of it. Recently it was done in something like Something Wild, was a sort of update of that, with the same basic idea, you've got this person, this man who is, has a very rigidly controlled, structured life, and but it's kind of dead and lifeless, and then this crazy broad comes rushing into his life, and upturns everything, and of course opens his heart and all the rest of it. You know, but it can be there can be a dark edge to it. And the Lady Eve, for example, the the crazy screwball dame is also kind of femme fatale. She's a, she's a con woman who's supposed to actually fleece this guy, but she falls in love with him. So there was a dark edge to it even then, and this then evolved. And I don't think this has been written about anywhere else, but. To me, it's a very clear evolution into the film noir, in which instead of the straight, sort of straight, repressed male and the screwball dame, you had the, the sort of down on his luck, seedy, run down male and the femme fatale. But the same kind of element. You've got this, this, this irrational presence that in the, in the film noir, the dark age had come all the way to the surface. 
Um, this was by the time World War II, you know, had, uh, had begun, and, and so there was definitely a, a darker edge to the collective consciousness was beginning to become visible. That's much more obviously a depiction of the emergence of the other. So the, 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 the basic idea of schizophrenic cinema is that it's showing us this conflict or this tension in our psyche between our conscious rational selves and and the unconscious, the id, which is this unruly, powerful force in our lives that we try to keep out, but that eventually comes rushing through and, and basically undoes all our best efforts to maintain control in our lives. And you would equate the id with the shadow, young shadow, something that just comes out and uh, well, eventually will come out and take its toll on us? I wouldn't necessarily equate the two. I mean, I, I've used the, the id kind of loosely in terms of the unconscious. Of course, Freud actually used it closer to the shadow in the sense that it was all these really primal urges and violence. And I think it, it had a somewhat negative connotation, which, of course, the shadow by definition is, although it's not necessarily uh, negative qualities, it, it's all the qualities that we deny in ourselves. They might even be good qualities, but we just aren't comfortable with them. So we push them into the unconscious and they, they sort of take on this form like a shadow. This literally a shadow is our own form in negative, but because it's specific to us, whereas the unconscious is a very general, undifferentiated kind of area of, of suppressed or forgotten material. Um, I mean, everything is in our unconscious pretty much, except what we're thinking right now. But then there's, the, there's a large part of what's unconscious in this moment that we can access if we choose to point the laser beam at it, let's say. But then there's this whole area that we can't access even if we want to. So we don't actually know it's there except through its effects. The, sh the shadow is, is specifically those areas that we've pushed most deepest down into the unconscious that we've most disowned and so they've gathered together in this area of deepest denial as, as the other, as, as the doppelganger, as the adversary, what have you. And so then that, that id matter, which is, is the shadow, as you point out, it comes to us from without. It's like it takes form because it's such a potent element of our psyche. It's almost like a magnetic there's some sort of magnetic uh, phenomenon, I think, that this, this very potent area of our psyche creates um, a corresponding embodiment outside of us so that we are then allowed or often even obliged to confront our shadow. So then the crazy dame, the femme fatale in the 50s, the, the alien you know, the, the invader, the body snatcher in the 60s, the hippie or the psychopath uh, and so on. The other has been evolving through American movies, uh, showing our evolving perception of ourselves and of our world. But the message is still pretty much the same, Jason. We have become disconnected with our primordial source, the uh, unconscious, God, uh, you can call him whatever you wanted to call him but uh, humanity has become disconnected. What is the solution? The shamanistic journey of unification? Mm. Yeah, it's individuation, was Jung's term. The solution is to, is to own that shadow so that we uh, allow ourselves to see it within ourselves. We, <clears throat> by definition, we can't actually uh, go to the, the unconscious. I mean, when we sleep and dream, of course we do, but as a, as a conscious intention to actually uncover areas of the unconscious isn't possible because how, how do we know where they are or what they are? When we begin to understand this phenomenon of, of um, the projected psyche that Jung talks about, when there's an area of our psyche that we cannot, cannot or will not integrate, it begins to materialize outside of us just in order to have some sort of existence. So then, if we begin to see our lives in this way, which is part of what Secret Life of Movies is about, is, is this animistic or shamanistic view of 
reality, which of course is a symptom of schizophrenia also, when we see external events or encounters as uh, embodiments or mirroring phenomenon uh, of disowned emotional, psychological matter, then this potentially allows us to isolate and identify those parts of our psyche that we have disowned by deduction, by intuition, by imagination, things we don't like outside of ourselves, people who act in certain ways that push our buttons, particularly in the most dynamic example is in a relationship. The more deeply in love we are with the person, the more painful it is. Why is that? Because they push our buttons, because they, they allow us or even force us to go into old childhood patterns of trauma. Um, because here's this person that we care about more than we've cared about anyone since our, since our mother or our father, when we were totally vulnerable. So all of this is, is a shamanic journey. It's just that we don't fully recognize it and we're not fully conscious of the potential for transformation in it. So we tend to try and stay on the surface and that never works. So, so the solution is to actually go deeper into whatever we're experiencing and allow that seeing to take us deeper into ourselves. And then if we actually see those areas that we've disowned, they, at least my experience seems to be that they, because we recognize them as ourselves, finally, and not the other, that seeing in itself is enough to draw them back to us. It's like a, a child that's been disowned and then locked up in the attic because we found it ugly or unpleasing to us, so we just tried to pretend it didn't exist, but we had to feed it and keep it you know, alive. Eventually, we have to recognize that it is our child, and then that seeing draws it back to us, and then it's integrated into our psyche, and we experience a new degree of wholeness. Jason, do you see the actual medium of cinema as more conducive to the uh, schizophrenic experience or facing our own schizophrenia? I mean, uh, let's look at what going to the cinema is versus uh, sitting watching TV or a book. I mean, in a cinema, you're basically trapped helplessly in a chair like Alex in A Clockwork Orange. You're in complete darkness where you almost seem to have no corporal form mm. <laughs> along with all these other lost souls. And then you're bathed in frenetic light and narrative until your personality melts away. Mm. Do you see watching, uh, do you see the medium as, uh, as uh, Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message? Yeah, I think that something I discovered also writing the book was that not only do movies naturally seem to gravitate towards depicting schizophrenic experiences in terms of you know, intense visionary states and, and trauma and all the rest of it, the actual act of watching a movie does correlate with what schizophrenia is described as being, which is total passivity and a cutoff from one's perceptions. So there's a split between uh, one's consciousness, uh, one's inner consciousness, and one's external reality. So schizophrenics find it very hard to connect. They're sort of adrift in this dream world, which is you know, what could better describe the experience of watching a movie than just letting yourself float off into a dream world. And I think one of the major appeals of movies is that it, they allow us to experience a simulation of life without being seen. So we can be immersed in this reality and watch these people doing these things and so it's just as if we're actually there, but there's no chance of being seen, unless you're in a Woody Allen movie, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, very true. So, I mean, that's that's a... There's something basic about that relief. I think we all have that, have had that feeling of like wanting to be invisible, wanting to be a fly on the wall, because we don't want to be alone and isolated the whole time. That can be suffocating and frightening, but at the same time, even more frightening is the idea of being exposed, of being seen. So movies offer this option of interacting without interacting, you know, of being present and not present 
it's sort of a bilocation thing. It's like dreaming also, isn't it? We're safe in our beds, asleep, could be no more environment, more comfortable than when we're asleep. It's a simulation of being in the womb while our imaginations are roving free. So we have the best of both worlds. So movies also simulate that experience of dreaming, which is similar to being in the womb. And then also what, what you're referring to, this loss of self being erased, this is something I've only recently recognized because I was, you know, I've been a movie addict. Uh, I've actually tried to quit movies. Uh, I just felt they were so compulsive to me and that I, they became sort of like a vice, like I would use movies as, as medication, like a, as long as I've got so many movies on my hard drive to watch, you know, this week, then I felt okay, like a junkie was his heroine, you know, and so then I'd spend the whole day looking forward to watching a movie. And, and so I, I observed these, these patterns in me, and <clears throat> they go back to childhood, but certainly to my very early 20s, where I literally did spend most of my time smoking pot and watching movies in bed, so trying to get back to that womb state without knowing it. Having to look at that did it, it did lead for a while to this feeling of uh, I, I actually needed to quit movies because they were actually harmful. But recently, I've I've had less and less time for watching movies, and so I use them more and more just for relaxation when I really am not ready to sleep, but I don't want to work, and I just want to turn my brain off. I'll t put on a movie, and it has to be a good movie because it has to actually occupy my thoughts uh, and take my thoughts away from my own stuff. So uh, just any movie is not going to do it because I'll get bored and I'll just go back into my thoughts. So observing this, I, I realized recently that actually watching a movie, a good movie, is, is kind of like a meditation because it allows us to erase our sense of identity temporarily. We just forget all about our personal histories and all the rest of it and just get immersed in this surrogate reality. So then that is also a schizophrenic experience which can be used or abused. I think, um, I mean, it's okay to medicate yourself from time to time. We all need it. And so to use movies as a way to erase oneself temporarily and just get into this sort of meditative state can be beneficial. I think, to our being, good for our health. But that kind of leaves out the whole question of what was behind the movie that you're watching because these movies are made by professionals and you know the movie industry has since day one been infiltrated and perhaps even established by uh, intelligence agencies. The CIA is deeply entrenched in filmmaking. There's, there's a pretty good case for making the, the, the whole of Hollywood was set up by intelligence agencies as a, a great big mind control experiment. I mean, I'm very open to that possibility, but even if you don't allow that, nonetheless, these movies are being made by people who have an awareness, like Hitchcock, of how to manipulate us psychologically. Hitchcock is considered a great filmmaker primarily for this reason, that he was a master of manipulation. So then movies are designed to flood out our sense of identity and then to reprogram us, even if it's just for two hours. They reprogram us to think that we're Cary Grant climbing around Mount Rushmore or that we're Keanu Reeves finding out he's the one. For two hours we're reprogrammed. We, we have this alternate experience downloaded into our consciousness. So yeah, the possibility for abusing that in a way that you described in Clockwork Orange is is undeniable, I think, and it it's probably happening um, and has been happening since the inception of movies in a way that just isn't being remarked upon. It's not we're not actually aware of how we're being reprogrammed uh, by the movies that we see. I think that there is some consciousnesses being directed at this now, but the assumption has always been that movies are harmless entertainment. And then on the other hand, you have the, the sort of hysteria around movie violence and how it creates copycat crimes, and that tends to come from the sort of groups that are very suspicious and untrustworthy and alarmist. So, so then we tend to dismiss the whole argument because the only 
place it's coming from is these right-wing fundamentalists or whoever, you know, people who, who aren't really trustworthy and perhaps aren't doing the research. They're just, it's knee-jerk stuff. So then the whole argument gets thrown out. But I, I do think it's a very valid argument, something that, that, that I'm certainly interested in looking at. I mean, even with the new movie Avatar, you have all sides crying wolf about this. And you've got from smokers, advocates complaining about Sigourney we were smoking, and right wingers complaining it's insulting the army or it's a pro environmentalist movie and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. it's definitely all over the place. But also, a lot of the movies you talk about in your book are not. You can say they're really not Hollywood agenda movies, for whatever it's worth, but it's actually the uh, entertainer's own schizophrenia being played out. It's their own medication or catharsis, whether it's Roman Polanski or Marlon Brando or, or Johnny Depp. So it, it is a two-way thing when the movie is made right. Yeah, I mean, you can't separate a product from its source, can you? So whatever agenda is going on behind a movie. I mean, think of something like Fight Club or Matrix. These are mainstream studio movies that somehow slip through the net. There's, there's two ways of looking at that, and, it, and it's not either or, it's both and. That on the one hand, that any product of society or of an industry is indirectly, if we trace it all the way back, is the product of the collective organism, the human species. So it's a, it's a product of the collective unconscious, just as if we were dreaming a collective dream. So it's going to carry, like if you take a blood sample you know, of a body, then that tells you everything you need to know about the body, or maybe not everything, but it, it's certainly it's a, it's a hologram, and it contains information pertaining to the whole. So the same with a movie, it may seem to be a product of these localized factors, but if you take a higher view, it's still coming from the whole collective system. So it does contain a great deal of information about that, the, the species, the collective. The question is, is, you know, how much, how clear is the signal in the noise? And so the more, because you know, by this theory, any movie is going to contain some truth in it, some information. But if there's too much noise, then you just it's not worth the trouble trying to find the signal. Uh, then you have a movie like Fight Club or Matrix is a little harder to say, but Fight Club brings up the, the second um, point, as I mentioned, which is that what you mentioned, that the people behind a the movie, they're bringing their unconscious to it. So whatever they're consciously doing, it's still going to the result is still going to contain elements of their unconscious drives, their wounds, their issues, all the rest of it. So, which is presumably, the second point is presumably what makes the first point valid, is that the movies are the product of individuals, not just corporations. Corporations don't, by definition, have a psyche or an unconscious, do they? But they are run by individuals. So somehow these... This, this information, this content, is coming through. And I think that I mean, the difference between Fight Club and Matrix would be that with Fight Club, it seemed to be the people involved were consciously wrestling with, with demons, with unconscious dilemmas, uh, with frustration, with rage. All of the themes in the movie, it, it would seem that the people who made the movie were wrestling with, certainly the, the author of the book and the director and the script writers and even the actors, you got the sense from Fight Club that this was a real, this was a coming together, a communal kind of enterprise that entailed going very deeply into this area of, of tension in the psyche. With Matrix, on the other hand, you got the sense that there was a couple of comic book aficionados who wanted to make a kick-ass superhero movie that was, <laughs> was realistic. And yet somehow, by some total fluke, they tapped into the vein and, and, and created you know, the greatest meta-myth in, in cinema history. And as you point out, horror and the supernatural genres are wonderful frameworks for the schizophrenic experience. Mm. 
But what I've noticed, and I think you pointed out too, is that it seems that the great ones, whether you know it's Nightmare on Elm Street or The Devil's Advocate or The Fallen, the divine forces are rather absent. Is this like a human versus a Lovecraftian world? Are we just afraid deep down inside that we're living in a great void? Well, I guess Matrix um, kind of addresses that, doesn't it? Because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a science fantasy with Lovecraftian elements. And, I mean, it was one criticism that I made of Matrix was how the real world was so much less appealing than the fake Matrix world. It's uh, something a lot of people have pointed out. They say, well, if it's a Gnostic movie, why is reality worse than true? Why does Cypher want to go back into the illusion? Mm -hmm. And even if you look at Fight Club, even after the narrator is in integrated with Tyler Durden, nothing has changed. Destruction is still coming. Right. It seems sometimes the schizophrenia cinema does not show us integration. It just shows us staring right into the abyss at the end. Right. And, and then, of course, I mean, God and the angels, I mean, repeatedly through artistic uh, history, have never been very well represented. Uh, Blake writes about Milton's Paradise Lost and how Satan is such a much more interesting character than God and that this was because Milton was a true poet and so he was of the devil's party without knowing it. The thing is that, that God is reality. God is truth. So it's everything that is. So to depict God as a force kind of outside of or separate within reality is impossible. So in a way, the struggle that's being depicted is between our personal selves and our, our impersonal, our true selves. And from the point of view of our personal selves, the truth is something very undesirable, something very threatening. So it brings it back to the shadow and the other and the double, all, all ideas that overlap. The shadow is everything that we disown. The other is everything that we're not everything that's unfamiliar to us, so that, that clearly overlaps with the shadow. And then the double, on the other hand, is a, an exact replica of ourselves, but that is threatening to us, that is actually annihilating to us, as in the myths of, of the doppelganger. And that's what Fight Club is all about. You know, Tyler Durden starts out as the other, is gradually revealed to be the narrator's shadow, and then finally his double, because the one has to destroy the other, and they have to be unified. You know, there's, there's the completion to the unification of the two halves, which is the conscious and the unconscious. Like individual ego consciousness to venture into the realms of the underworld, the shamanic realms in which the schizophrenic is drowning, is to risk being absorbed and swallowed up and destroyed by the you know, that journey, but it's the only way to bring consciousness, the light of consciousness into, into the shadow, into the id, into the unconscious. So potentially it will bring consciousness to the unconscious, so then what is unconscious becomes conscious, and that's, that's the encounter with the double, that's, that's gnosis, that's, that's meeting God, it's seeing that we, we are God, if we, if we actually allow ourselves to be absorbed into the totality of our being, we'll be annihilated by that, but we'll pass through the eye of the needle into a whole other realm of existence, our true, our true nature, which is reality, the totality of it. So, how do you depict that in a movie? I mean, it's impossible, really. So, Matrix, in a way it was accurate, because to the personal self, Reality is a very harsh affair, and it, it strips away all our wants, all our desires, all our goals, all our attachments. So we, metaphorically, we would end up like these, you know, head-shaved serfs, you know, dressed in, in, in sackcloth, eating gruel, you know. <laughs> Just, so symbolically, there's something in that. We wouldn't have any sort of personal sovereignty at all. Uh, in reality, that's the only way we can have personal sovereignty is by constructing this identity that is isolate from the whole system, 
and that can follow its own agendas. So like Lucifer, we, we get to reign in hell because we don't want to serve in heaven. And it's very interesting because, as you've been pointing out, in the Matrix, Neo is the savior, but only because it's part of the program of the Matrix. He's been prophesied to be the savior, so he's, in, in essence, a false savior. And this true, or his uh, meta-destiny, becomes being in integrated with Agent Smith. Their interaction is far more powerful than both realities together, Zion or the Matrix. Right. Yeah, well, unfortunately, that was never developed in the sequels, was it? It was... you got to have to figure it out yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> through a lot of exegesis. Right. So you have to actually do the work for the filmmakers, which brings us back to what I was saying about them, that they didn't really know what they were doing at the first one. It was just like something came through them, and then when they actually attempted to, to develop it, in keeping with all the expectations and all the readings that had been done of the, the first film, there was just no way because they weren't actually working with their personal shadow matter on those films, the Wachowskis. God only knows, you know, what was really behind the Matrix. It seemed like the whole film was a sort of psyop, like, like the Star Wars films, that there were just many hands and many minds behind it. But the thing with the false messiah, I think, is... It might be a sidetrack, but it's kind of interesting to me because what makes the Messiah false is that people turn him into something that he's not and they turn him into an excuse not to have to be what he is. So with this happened with Christ and Christianity and, and with Neo, as I wrote in Matrix War, he may be the one, but he's not the only. He's the first, that's what made him the one. And anyone, there's always going to be a first. I mean, if Jesus Christ existed, then he was the first to become a full embodiment of God in, 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 in the physical, in a physical body. But the, what would be the point of that if it wasn't going to create a chain reaction by which the whole species began to embody God? And so then God would have many organs of perception and not just the one. The alternative is for Christ to become the king of humanity and to have everybody worshipping at his feet, which is what Lucifer wanted. So then Christ would become Satan. <laughs> I think I think the Matrix was sort of toying with that, but it just didn't really get grok it that, that the Neo Neo was part of the program. So then he was a test, you know. Because if people just bought into the prophecy baloney and worshipped him as the one, they wouldn't recognize what the true meaning of his existence, which was that everyone is the one, because we're all hooked into the program and we can all shape reality. We can all, like Christ said, those who come after me will, will do even greater miracles. So what does that mean? That means that he was passing on a virus that would spread and take over the whole system and, until it became fully conscious of itself, at which point the matrix ends because then it's like a shell that cracks open. It served its purpose. Uh, but it's not to do with fighting the matrix from within. I mean, a, a caterpillar doesn't fight to get out of the chrysalis. <laughs> you know, that, that wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. A caterpillar does is surrender to its knowing, which is that this is its, you know, this is what it has to do. And, and then the butterfly emerges from that state of surrender and then the chrysalis cracks and, and a whole new state of being is attained but there wasn't any struggle or resistance you know, or revolutionary movement required for that to happen. You also write about the great American psycho and cinema and why audiences feel so drawn to this character. And what I'm getting, and I don't know if this ties in a little bit to Neo becoming Lucifer, but we love the great American psycho, whether it's uh, Hannibal Lecter, I guess would be the best example, but there are many more, because this person is basically God. God kills and it's good, that's great. God makes reality what he wants, is that, and that's great. Is that why we're truly drawn to the American psycho? Um, I think it's more to do with... Uh back to the shadow really, that the the psycho, and I, and I don't 
consider Hannibal Lecter to be a good example of this. I mean, he's an obvious example because he... The most famous He's the most famous, but also he, as a character, as a concept, he kind of exposes the machinery of the great American psychopath, which, by the way, is, is Phil Snyder's uh, thesis. It's, we worked together on that chapter, so you might want to talk to Phil about this, too, at some point. But both, neither of us put much stock in Hannibal Lecter because he's not actually believable as a character, that he doesn't represent a, a kind of person in, in, in society. Um, they simply don't exist. The psychopaths who are enlightened beings. You know. So Hannibal Lecter actually glamorizes and idealizes, idealizes the psychopath. But by doing so, it, it does, he does kind of show the it's a sort of living thesis, really, in that, yes, he, he, he is imitating God. Yes, he is on a quest for transcendence. He is the ultimate predator. I guess it combines sort of two apparently opposing desires or urges in ourselves, in our psyche. One is the bid for transcendence, to become God, to become, to transcend the physical the freedom from the identity, etc. And the other is, is this pertaining to the shadow, which is, depending on how conscious it is, it's either, if it's conscious, it is the drive or the, the bid to integrate the shadow, which entails embodying the shadow. So then it, it entails recognizing the Travis Bickle, the Charles Manson in, in ourselves, that we're all capable of that. And if, if, society uh, spews forth these individuals, they are also embodiments of the collective shadow. Uh, they're not just random products of society or products of MK Ultra or what have you. Like the movies, they are you know, part of a collective, and so they're reflecting back at us. And so um, an awareness of that, that naturally attracts us to these characters because we recognize that they embody aspects of ourselves that we need to integrate in order to be whole. Now, if that's unconscious, then what happens is either we revile the psychopath and say he should be shut away, he should be executed, he's scum, he's evil, he's the enemy of society, which is the more kind of socially sanctioned response, reaction, or, uh, as is getting more and more prevalent, we idealize and worship the psychopath and, and consider him to be this rebel figure, this heroic figure, who is um, at least, you know, individual. He's an individual spirit. The, the basic kind of American model for a hero, like John Wayne, is really a psychopath. If we actually look at those movies, particularly the searches, uh, Clint Eastwood did it in Unforgiven. He, he came clean and said, Actually, I'm a psychopath. My character is a psychopath with, with demons. He's wounded. But even in that movie, um, he got to be the good guy by the end because it, Clint created a bad guy that was so nasty that we want Clint to kill him. So then we actually, he, you know, there's this double thing that even, <laughs> yeah. even when we are allowed to see the truth, we, we don't care. We say, okay, Clint's a psychopath, but he's our psychopath. I guess the culmination would be the movie Natural Born Killers. Yeah. Where the psychopaths are completely defied. Yeah. And they're the only likable characters in the movie. Yeah, in comparison. <laughs> in comparison to Tommy Lee Jones and Robert Downey Jr., who's a real scum, you know, that we have to kind of like and even admire Mickey and Mallory. I mean, Mickey, I would say, is closer to a believable, trans transcending psychopath than. Hannibal Lecter. Uh, he's close to what Manson appeared to be, in that he's he's turning murder into a, a philosophy. And I guess there is something basically appealing about that because of us having to repress and disown our primal instincts. To be civilized means to repress that side. We have to repress the desire to kill anyone who you know, gets on our nerves, or to rape any woman that we're attracted to. These are primal urges that 
obviously we need to repress them. You know, why is it going to get into into trouble? Yeah, but all of our all of our prime allergies. I mean, even the lesser ones are suppressed. All right. We can't talk at work. We can't talk back to our boss or our wives. We, right. They're all repressed. And I guess that was what Freud was starting to address 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think when violence and sexuality, are, because they're so closely linked, like in the animal kingdom, the sexual act is often violent. It's the same sort of energy that's coming out creation, destruction. So it, it, it figures, yin and yang, they're going to be very closely intertwined. But because of this, then, as human beings, we... The odd part, the odd thing, Miguel, is that we seem to be more ashamed of our sexuality than our violent nature. We consider repressing our violent side to be a good thing, of course. Violence is, is, is bad. You know, violence is hostile, it's antisocial. There's, there's no excuse for violence unless, of course, it's on a mass scale and it's called war. Um, but individual violence must be punished. But then on the other hand, although sex is considered a good thing, really, and it's encouraged and it's you know, propagated through the media so it's coming out of our ears, we are still programmed from our youth to be deeply ashamed of our sexuality. And I would say more ashamed, like if a, if a child is caught playing with his ding dong um, he probably gets more shamed for it by his parents than than if he hits his little sister or at least equally so that passing on generational shame around sexuality it ties into the, the suppression of our violent instincts and urges so if we repress our sexuality as well as our antisociality then essentially that's it we're, we're repressing everything really that doesn't leave anything to express really, because in a way everything's an expression of sexuality and, and violence itself is a sort of because it's a territorial thing and a, and a protect protective thing and a, and a way to get a mate you know that the strongest gets laid kind of thing violence you could say is even a side effect of sexuality so perhaps that's why there's this bid to, to suppress our sexuality and to distort it and I think we're inundated with it. That's part of the same program, because if sexuality uh, is communicated and propagated in a way that's extremely coarse and puerile and titillating and all the rest of it, then it, that intensifies the sense of shame, because we're constantly being sexually triggered while at the same time knowing that it's, it's kind of unclean. Because it is, and the pornography is unclean, the sexual advertising is unclean. And these things do increase, because they increase our sexual desires, they trigger our sexual desires, our hormone, hormonal responses, without providing an outlet. They also increase violence and savagery in the society, because if you're constantly surrounded by sexual imagery without an outlet for it, then it's going to come out in other ways. In your introduction, Jason, you bring up the term synchromysticism. Uh, I don't recall you using it again, although it's an extremely fascinating concept, especially when you tie it in with your views on paranoia in cinema. What exactly is synchromysticism? Synchromysticism is a movement on the internet which has, I don't know how many proponents, I only know of a very few, Jake Kotze, Chris Knowles, Steve Wilner, there's a bunch that I know personally and then there's a whole bunch of others that I don't have any idea about. And it's to do with finding hidden meaning in pop culture. It's to do with reading uh, artifacts of pop popular culture for recurring themes and motifs that indicate a sort of emerging Gnostic movement, if you will, an awakening, a global awakening. It's Jung's synchronicity taken to narrow down to a very specific thing. Synchromysticism is no different than synchronicity, really. It's just that that movement that calls itself synchromistic chooses to focus on popular culture exclusively rather than the whole of existence, as Jung did. 
And uh, for what are some examples of uh, things that have been seen or that this movement has have noted? The thing in uh, Matrix that Neo's Thomas Anderson's passport expires on September 11th, 2001. That would be an example of woo, wow. That that's a very sort of specific example that. In a way, that's slightly different what the synchronistics do. That's almost close to conspiracy theory because, oh, well, maybe that was put there by people who knew, you know. But it could also be something the synchronistics would pick up on, that it's a clue that, that 9-11 was this stargate that was to do with, you know, a, a wobble in consensus reality like the Matrix program breaking down, and which I think there's some truth in that. So that would be a way to link together. Uh, the Matrix with 9-11 and turn that into an, a narrative that includes both. Uh, to be honest, a lot of synchromysticism I find very trivial. It's to do with um, observing actors, for example, the different movies they make and how there are recurring themes in those movies. And so kind of using an actor's career as a way to read uh, the collective consciousness, you know, what's going on there. I say trivial because if it focuses too much on the products themselves and just mapping all of the sinks and saying, oh, look, Jim Carrey was green in this movie and he was green in that movie, so Jim Carrey's the <laughs> green man, you know? But <laughs> And then that leaves kind of a lot of room for interpretation there. I mean, it's different from what I do in Secret Life movies, which is just use movies as, as a launching point to go deeper into into the psyche. And my own psycho psychology specifically, I, although the book isn't autobiographical, it may as well be, because reading it back, I see how I was uncovering so many different patterns in my own psyche that I didn't even know about at the time. I just thought I was writing about movies and, and yes, you know, exploring the collective psyche, but I wasn't aware of actually uncovering patterns and wounds in my own psyche at the time. It's it's a no-brainer, because why else would I be attracted to those movies? But actually the realization that that was what I was doing didn't come until just recently when the book was being published, and I, I realized actually, in a way, this is the, kind of the most honest book that I've written. It's the most complete sort of expression of, of where I'm at, and yet when I first wrote it ten years ago, it was just a book about movies, so... That's sort of a mystery in itself. It's like this book is a book about how everything has an unconscious, including products. You know, movies have an unconscious. Well, my own book has it. It's, it's unconscious. So there's many, many layers. Well, I think that's all the time we have today, Jason. I'd like to thank you very much for coming on Aeon Bide and talking about your uh, wonderful book and ideas. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, if I could direct our listeners to my website, that would be nice. Certainly, um, certainly, please do. It is going to be a hard one for people, so I'll spell it. It's aoluskefus.com, which is A-E-O-L-U-S-K-E-P-H-A-S.com. And I'm just putting the website together now. Hopefully by the time this airs, it will be up. But this will have information about the um, group that I'm running, which is about existential detective work and exploring mythic narratives. So it, it does tie into what we've been talking about, but it's it's a practical application of this of this um, knowledge uh, in people's daily lives. And um, I also have a blog, Vagabond Blues, which you can just Google Jason Horsley Vagabond Blues, um, and a couple of podcasts, which you'll be able to find easily uh, just by going to that site. Well, thank you very much, Jason, and uh, have yourself a good day now. Thanks, Miguel. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers, Jason Horsley on the dire straits of humanity's collective consciousness. From his absorbing book, The Secret Life of Movies, schizophrenic and shamanic journeys in American cinema. I don't know if Jason has his website up as you listen to this, but please check out his blog, movieblues.blogspot.com. And don't forget to download Aeon Byte number 12, our guest, which was actually Jason when he went by the name Jake. 
and Aeon Bite number 50 with Eric Wilson for an encyclopedia and sage wisdom of Gnostic cinema that includes more of the Matrix and Fight Club as well as the Truman Show, Dark City, The 13th Floor, The Gnosis of David Lynch and Philip K. Dick, and so much more. And this whole synchro mysticism movement sounds very piquant. Paranoia comes from the Greek for beyond the mind. And in a sense, that's what we true seeker warriors are attempting to do. And being paranoid sometimes just means you've been paying attention the entire time. In the desert of the real, the mirages vanish if we focus with a little bit of effort and a bravery of awareness. And I believe the whole program can be surmised by one simple saying from the Gospel of Thomas, Loia number 70. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. And in the end, we are the ones who must become the directors and actors of our own movies learning from the Gnostic Gospels in their movie incarnations. Like William Blake wrote, a man must create his own system or be ruled by another man's system. And like I say, you must write your own Gospel and live your own myth, or else the Lucas and Camerons of the cosmos laugh all the way to the bank with the spiritual capital that belongs to you. And we are the Gnostics, those veterans of a thousand psychic wars who have set the controls to the heart of the sun. We are the sailors on the seas of fate between the gnashing rocks of orthodoxy all the way to the farthest shores of imagination. We are the revenge of the myth and the justice of Bina against Jehovah and his angelic mafia. We are the ones who run with those searching for the truth and avoid those who have found it. We are Champion Eternal, and the heroes with a thousand faces, but one real divine identity. We are the Gnostics. I am, and I am Abraxas, broadcasting at the Virtual Alexandria through the God Above God Dat Cam. The road is ended, the song is over, thought I'd have something more to say. But don't cultivate any troubles, my beloved true seekers, because like heaven above,